Um, well, three, the count that I don't speak Russian. Um, I, when I get excited, I start to talk fast, and two, I'm very easily excited. Um, so if I do start talking fast, please wave your arms furiously and I'll try and slow down. So, how did Django get where it is? Well, let's turn the clock back. Ten years ago, the year is 2003, uh, how many people in this room were doing web development around that time, around 2003? Okay, so a, a decent sort of number. How many of those people were doing web development in Python at that time? Oh, actually, a couple of people there. Okay. So, the web world is kind of recovering from the dot-com crash. Uh, technologically, J2EE, ASP.NET are the serious enterprise players. Uh, PHP is the hacker's tool of choice. CGI Bing lingers for reasons we can't quite understand. Um, and Python's play in this market is Zoop. Big, big tool, it uses Python under the hood, but a lot of people criticise it as being not Pythonic enough for whatever, however you want to describe that. And because Zoke wasn't right, uh, there were a lot of projects starting up trying to fix the problem. Um, it was Cherry Pie, Coyote, Paste, Wasp, Snakelets, Webware, Spice, Nevow, Skunk Web, and many, many more. Uh, I remember around 2004, 2005, an author started a blog series in which uh, once a month they would publish a new review of another Python web project uh, where they, would, they had a standard project on something like a blog and every month they would re-implement that blog in another web framework. Um, that, that blog went on for six or seven months uh, and had no sign of, uh, of, of slowing down because there were certainly other, lots of other frameworks that they, that they could look at. At about that same time, we turn our attention to Lawrence, Kansas, uh, and the newsrooms of the Lawrence Journal World. The Journal World is a family-owned newspaper. Uh, they sell about 20,000 copies every time they print uh, the newspaper. So it's a very small newspaper organisation in a, what is essentially a very small university town right in the middle of the United States. Um, but they did have a very forward-looking, progressive newsroom. Mostly because the organisers and the owners at the time were aware that if they didn't start paying attention to the internet and start coming up with some sort of strategy to treat the internet, they were going to disappear like every other small newspaper in the United States. And part of their major play was this website called Lawrence.com. Essentially it was a, a what's on guide for, for Lawrence. So if you were a person living in Lawrence, you could find out what bars were going to be open tonight, what concerts were going to be playing at those bars, and what the drink specials were going to be that night, and what time the closing time was. But it wasn't just a static advertising site like a lot of these sort of uh, what's on websites tend to be. It was very, very actively maintained as a database of useful information about the social activities around Lawrence. Uh, Adrian Holovarty, who is the, one of the BDFLs, one of the founders of the Django project, is a journalism major working at, in the back office uh, of Lawrence.com. And over the years of building websites to support the paper, he and the team have built a bunch of tools to help publish news. Uh, originally, it all started in PHP, but after a while, they realized that that's not a good engineering solution. They're not, not happy with what they're getting out of PHP. And so they decided to start from scratch with Python. And they built this thing called the CMS. Um, and that started essentially as a code generator. If you, if you go over there, there's a couple of talks that Jacob has given at Google and a couple of other locations where he describes the history of Django in great depth. Um, and it originally started as a code generation tool. Uh, at some point, Ian Bicking bumped into Adrian at a, at a Chicago meetup and taught Adrian about meta classes, and that essentially turned Django into most of what you see today, what you know about today when you think about Django. So February 2005, Django has been used, the, the internal project called The CMS has existed for about two years, maybe a little bit less. And in February 2005, Adrian Holovarty goes to PyCon. Now at this point, DjangoProject.com doesn't exist. Django as a name hasn't even been picked yet. It's not open source, it's entirely an in-house project in a newspaper. It's got, it's got three developers essentially, Adrian, uh, Jacob Kaplan-Moss and Simon Willison, and some other people in-house at the Journal World who would help out from time to time. And there's really only a handful of sites that are using it. They're all internal Lawrence Journal World websites. Uh, in February 2005, Adrian Holovarty went to PyCon, or PyCon US, that is. And the big topic of discussion at that PyCon was why is Python web development so damn hard? And 
he sat there and listened to a whole bunch of people talk about what they were doing and their project and you know, yet another one of the thousands of web frameworks that were available in Python at the time. And said, well, we've got something. Why don't I give a presentation? So he stood up and gave a lightning talk at PyCon 2005. In five minutes, he built a web blog. He did the, the classic build a blog in five minutes demo. And he was absolutely swamped with interest. Now, the code isn't open sourced. It's not called Django. The interest is because what he's presenting was not a theoretical project. It was an actual framework being used on real websites to do real work. And as a result of the, the amount of interest that they got at that PyCon, they decided, or Adrian and Jacob together, decided to push the journal world to make the project open source and release it to the community so that everybody could use it and extract from this useful body of code a framework, which they called Django, and then a commercial product, which they called Ellington, which was built on top of Django. In May 2005, uh, Adrian launched a website called ChicagoCrime.org. Now, I don't know if how many of you remember Chicago Crime, remember it, it popping out. No? Okay. So Chicago Crime was the very first mashup of Google Maps data. This was before Google Maps had an API. Adrian reverse engineered the JavaScript that Google used to publish web, uh, uh, Google Maps to make a mashup of a map of Chicago and where all the crimes were happening because the Chicago Police Department publishes a, an RSS feed of all of the reported crimes in Chicago. And it was written in Django. Essentially, this became a precursor to what then became, or eventually became every block, the, website, the, the company that Adrian started a couple of years later. And if you look at the, the announcement, the comments and the announcement um, for every block, there is a comment a few pages, a few lines down uh, where Mark Hedlin says, fantastic work, any chance of open sourcing the tool so that people in other cities could set up a sing similar sites? And Adrian responds, Mark, the site is built on a Python web framework called Django, which we plan to open source as soon as we finished writing documentation. Stay tuned and thanks for all the great passion, all the great feedback. And so, July 16, 2005, Django is open sourced. They put up a djangoproject.com website, they go to a Chicago users group and give a presentation about this new web framework that had just open sourced. And within a day, the community had started to grow. Um, one day later, there was 100 people in the Django, hash Django IRC room, and they'd already started to receive their first patches from the community. And not little things either. This is, these were serious patches. The very one of the first big ones that was added was support for Whiskey. When Django, excuse me, when Django was originally published, it was um, mod Python only, and within a day, it supported Whiskey because of the contributions of the community. Step forward a few more months. November 2005, Django had its first formal packaged release, Django 0.90, and around that time, in another obscure corner of the world, uh, I downloaded Django for the very first time. I had a series of things that I've been tinkering around, with, uh, tinkering around with. I had used Python for a very long time and had had this great revelation that uh, the internet and the web, well, these web things were going to become big one of these days. So I decided to have a look at uh, yet another Python web framework and have a look at Django. And essentially, within six weeks, I got my commit bit. Okay, so um, six weeks after I had downloaded Django for the very first time, I was committing code to Django. Um, within a few days, I'm trying to think it was exactly the same day, or within a few days, uh, Luke Plant, another Django core developer, got his commit bit. A few months after that, Malcolm Tradinic um, got his commit bit. Now, this was all happening around uh, sort of the start of 2006. Django was going through its, sort of its, la most, its, its last really big set of changes that have affected the API. Uh, it was called magic removal. Uh, magic removal was a process of changing the, the syntax for the ORM primarily, so the way that you represented models and the way you issued queries on those models. Uh, before magic removal, uh, didn't have the dot filter chaining that you're familiar with, and there's also some internals about the way modules were being imported and modified uh, at load time. Um, the Django that you see today is essentially what came out of magic removal. There, there have been a lot of modifications since, but the Django, a Django project built on 0.95, which was the release that happened in July 2006, would look very, very familiar to you today. Um, little known fact, uh, just remembering fondly of the dead, uh, Aaron Schwartz, the, the hacker who um, took his own life a month ago, is essentially largely responsible for why Django's ORM looks the way it does. The filter chaining syntax was something that he contributed to the Django project in discussions around December of 2005. So Django has its... Uh, Dips its hat to, uh, to memory of Aaron Schwartz. 
Jacob uh, Kaplan Moss, one of the other co-founder co co of Django, has done an occasional survey of the size of the Django community. Um, and in March 2007, he published his first survey of how big is Django. At that point, DjangoProject.com was receiving uh, 1 million hits per month. So this is a project that has now been open sourced for less than two years uh, and was receiving a million hits a month on its website. It was receiving 1,000 downloads a day. There were 4,500 people on Django users and 2,000 on Django Dev, the developer's back channel for people wanting to contribute to Django. Five committers, um, essentially the, the, the original Adrian and Jacob, Luke Plant, Malcolm Trudenik and myself. Um, there were some other contributors who were there and, and, and adding bits of code along the way, but that was the main core of people who were adding and contributing code at the time. And 160 entries in our author's file. We, we are, well, we try to be, very, very rigorous about um, acknowledging when people give us code. There were a, a cultural habit that started very, very early on, that if someone gave us a patch that we committed, we would thank them in the commit notes, and if it was anything other than a typo, any sort of significant contribution, we would put them into the author's file so they have a permanent record of the fact that they were contributing to this open source project. September 2008, Django 1.0 was released, which was our, we, we had a very, very firm policy of backwards compatibility. We know that we wanted to, attract, to, to approach backwards compatibility, um, and we, we cut our 1.0 release two days before we held the very, very first DjangoCon US. DjangoCon US uh, had about had 200 attendees. It was uh, hosted at Google's facility uh, in Mountain View. Uh, the tickets sold out in 15 minutes. Uh, and around that time, we also founded the Django Software Foundation. Because we were going to this big milestone uh, event in Django's history, we decided that we needed to go legitimate. We needed to move the copyrights out of the journal world and into a separate organisation. There's also, we needed to accept some money from Google to be able to host this conference, so we needed to have a body that could accept money. April 2009, we had the first European Django Con. Uh, 150 people in Prague. Uh, unfortunately, that, that event wasn't videoed. Every other Django event has been videoed, and you can find the, find the videos around. But this essentially shows us that it wasn't just a United States thing. There was also a European interest as well. November 2009, we, we get to another of Jacob's surveys. At this point, Django Project has grown to 4.7 million hits per month. So that's a growth of 3.7 million hits in uh, a year and a half. We're still only getting 1,000 downloads a day, but there's two contributing facts to that. One is that when we actually pushed out a release, that would go up to 5,000 downloads a day for a, couple of, uh, for like a couple of days after that release. The second is that Django is starting to, because we've actually got a 1.0 release, Django is being packaged by uh, operating system distributors. So we don't know how many people installed Django from their Debian repository or their RPM repository. There's now 16,000 subscribers on Django users, 5,100 subscribers on Django Dev, 15 committers, and 447 authors in the authors file. So that's an increase of uh, another 300 authors in the space of 18 months. In July 2010, uh, I take over as president of the Django Software Foundation. Prior to that, Jacob had been the, the founding president. Jacob and Adrian at that time were still on the board. Jacob has since resigned. Now, from a community perspective, this is a big step because it's a, a devolution of power away from the original core team. Jacob and Adrian, even at this time, were not contributing to the core project as much as they once had, and that's been a continuing pattern. Jacob and Adrian are still around, but they don't contribute code in the same way that they once did. And passing off the, the, the baton to, uh, to, to myself as president of the DSF is part of that process of the project growing on. They're still there, they're still part of the community, but they're not running the community on a day-to-day -day basis. March 2012 is the most recent survey that Jacob has done to size the Django community. The Django project website now gets 6 million hits a month. Now that's just the Django project site, it doesn't count docs and code, which are themselves massive, uh, massive websites of their own. Downloads per day is a really, really hard number to get because it's, it was, it's not exactly meaningful anymore because so many people are using uh, PyPI mirrors and uh, repositories like uh, Debian repositories or Red Hat repositories. But as an indicator, 10% of the packages on PyPI are tagged as being Django relevant. And that's probably an underestimate because not everybody uses the, uh, the packaging uh, tags you know, the, uh, um, inside PyPI correctly. There's 21,700 subscribers on Django users, 7,000 subscriptions on Django Dev, 28 committers and 524 entries in the author's file. <coughs> and so we get to where we are today. So 
how exactly did this happen? That's, that's the what happened. That's how Django got to be what it is today. But um, why did it happen? How did it happen initially? And why did it continue to happen? Why did the community grow? Well, Django's been around publicly for about eight years. The rate of growth is slowing, but that's hardly surprising because you, you know, growth is not an infinitely sustainable um, principle. You have to, at some point, the rate of growth needs to slow. And as, at least as far as we can make out, the Django community, the size of the Django community, isn't contracting, so it's not getting any smaller. Attendance at DjangoCon, uh, DjangoCon has increased every year. Uh, DjangoCon EU, uh, have, they've released tickets in a series of tranches, and every single one of those tranches has sold out in a matter of minutes, usually less than two minutes. So there's a lot of interest in Django. Why has that happened? What is it about Django that's made it successful? Why has, how has the Django community been successful in that? Well, there's a certain amount, I can't deny there is a certain amount of the fact that Django was in the right place at the right time. Uh, there's a Victor Hugo quote that says, nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Django was not the only Python web framework at the time. Um, but it was the only Python web framework that was being used in a serious media organisation uh, in that kind of way. And as a result, it, it gave us sort of a credence, it was... It, it looked like it was going to be a serious, sustainable project. There was some money behind it because it was being maintained commercially by a, by a, a journalism company. The, the rest of the Python web space was a little bit of a mess. Django comes in as a working system that's, that's available in production. It's also worth considering, Carmen is here, um, Flask is essentially, can, can claim almost exactly the same sort of thing. It was in the right place at the right time. Flask was originally an April Fool's Day joke that just kind of got a little bit out of control because it was in the right place at the right time. Django had been around for a couple of years at that point and discussions had started to talk about how Django was too complicated or too big for small projects or maybe there were bits of the architecture that needed to be replaced and interest in microframeworks was starting to take off. And in this case, the joke was being made by someone who has a reputation of being very, very good at what he does. So yes, it was a joke, but then there's so much interest in the joke that the joke kind of grew its own legs and started running. And now we have Flask, which is, you know, at least a, a reasonable competitor to Django in many respects. There's also a certain amount of wow factor that was involved. Um, the being build a blog in five minutes is kind of a cliche at this point. But you have to remember that in 2005, it was a really big deal. Because not all web frameworks can do that. Ruby on Rails, a lot of its um, popularity grew out of the fact that it was, there was a 10 minute screencast where they built a web block and they showed that you could do this instead of having to get involved in some serious J2EE bondage and discipline. Django's admin was also a very impressive party piece. You know, we, we still have Django's admin and there's a lot of um, resistance to taking Django's admin out of Django's core because it's a very impressive thing to have out of the box. But it's not just about flash and having wow factor. Django solved a real problem and demonstrated it was solving a real problem. Now this is important for two reasons. Firstly, it demonstrated that Django wasn't an academic exercise. It wasn't someone's experiment in solving the web problem. There was a real business case driving the engineering process. Something is hard to do, it needs to be not hard to do. Let's fix that. And the problems, that the things that got fixed were the things that were difficult to do. So there was an actual engineering reason why the features that evolved, evolved when they did. And secondly, it also meant that there were engineering resources behind the development of Django. And this was particularly important in the early days. The fact that Django was open sourced was, from the point of view of the journal world, irrelevant. It didn't matter whether it was open sourced or not. They were using Django internally. They were going to continue to use Django internally. But by open sourcing it, they got a whole bunch of other people to help them out. J uh, uh, the journal world got some free engineering resources, but they were going to be throwing engineering resources at Django anyway. What it meant was that their engineering resources switched from building a tool internally to managing a community who were helping them build a tool. Now, during this, essentially during that critical period of growth, during those first couple of years before they got to version 1.0, it meant that there was someone whose job it was to make sure that Django got better. And that's not an insignificant thing when it comes to open source projects because you need to have the fuel to keep those fires burning. It also solved the whole problem, not just parts of the problem. Um, 
One of the competitors to Django, at the time when Django came out, was a web framework called Turbo Gears. And Turbo Gears is still around, it's kind of evolved and, and modified a little bit along the way. But the big difference between Turbo Gears and Django was that Django said, here is all of your tools. Here is a framework, here is a, a template language, here is an ORM, here's a database layer, here's a forms, a forms of package. All of the things you need are in this box. Go ahead, have fun. Turbo Gears took a different approach. It was saying, here's, here's a best of breed. What you need to do is you need to pick a router, you need to pick a template language, you need to pick an ORM, but we've, we've done a little bit of uh, manipulation to make these easier to fit together. Um, the other option, of course, was to do all that packaging yourself. You could pick at random an ORM or pick at random a template language and build your own custom framework. Now, Turbo Gears put a focus on um, here are a bunch of pieces we've, we've decided to fit together, but they did very much put the emphasis on you get to pick whatever you want to put in. You don't like our template language, you can use your own. And then they would change their mind. Uh, SQL objects was used in version 1.0 and version 1.1 used SQL alchemy, which meant that all of a sudden all this code that was in, SQL, uh, in uh, uh, Turbo Gears 1 wouldn't work in Turbo Gears 1.1, at least not without switching out and keeping the old decisions around. Now, there's well-documented psychology about why that isn't necessarily a good thing. From a, from a hacking perspective, from an engineering perspective, it's very easy to stand up and say, hey, it sh everything should be pluggable. You should be able to drop in anything that you want at any given point in time. Um, Barry Schwartz is a psychologist. He's written a, a book called The Paradox of Choice. And it's, he's documented, essentially, that giving people choices makes them less happy. One of the reasons that Apple is successful is they say, you want a computer? That's the computer you can have. The alternative is the PC world where you can have anything you want and you go to the Dell page and there's 4,000 laptops, all of which are trivially different. The analysis that Barry Schwartz has done of that psychology is that essentially it means that if you buy an Apple laptop and it isn't right or it doesn't completely match all your expectations, you're willing to accept it because I only had one choice. But if you had 4,000 choices and you're not happy, the reason must be because you made the wrong choice. So you end up, there's a, there's a weird psychology at play here where giving people less options actually makes them happier because they stop worrying about having made the wrong choice. I'd argue that this is part of the reason why, why Django uh, is, was successful in that way because you could pick the framework and the framework worked. And yeah, you can switch out various parts, but the focus wasn't on the fact that it was switchable, the focus was on the fact that it worked and there was a lot of focus on making those parts work together. Tied along with that, Django spent a lot of effort in documentation. When I came to Django, I was in a state where I had essentially never worked on web stuff before. I was still trying to work out how, at a, you know, at a low level, um, the you know, HTTP and the internet worked. I never got PHP. I never understood what on earth it was trying to do. The documentation was awful and in many cases wrong. Um, and that's actually been carried out today. Uh, there are the security problems that exist on the internet, all the stuff that's on the OWASP 10, top 10 list. Someone did a survey recently and discovered that something like, I think it was 75% like of tutorials on the internet teaching people how to use PHP properly, teach people how to put bugs in, or security holes into their system. Um, that's not good. Linguistically, I didn't like Perl. Um, Perl was also going through its, its Perl 6 schism, was well, well, in, well underway at that point. Ruby looked better, but it still smelt a little bit of Perl, like Perl to me. And Ruby's documentation was genuinely awful, in my opinion. Why the Lucky Stiff and his introduction to Ruby and introduction to Rails is fantastic art, but I personally think it's appalling documentation. And uh, Ruby's opinion at the time seemed to be very much that an automatically generated API guide was all that you needed to use Rails. And I don't think that's true. Django spent a lot of time building documentation. Now, I knew when I liked Python, um, and I was stuck personally in this whole framework decision cycle. When I got to Django's tutorial, I ran through Django's tutorial and that gave me enough confidence that I understood both how Django was trying to solve the web problem, broadly speaking, what would need to have change in order to sort of fix various bits and pieces. The documentation got me from getting, from basically knowing entry point of not really understanding the internet to understanding it well enough to be able to contribute and make this thing better. Even if Django completely decays to dust, and at some point it will, it's inevitable that Django will get replaced by something better at some point in the future. One of the endearing uh, legacies of, uh, of Django uh, is the importance that it placed on documentation and human documentation, not automatically generated documentation. 
There are even conferences that essentially come out of people in the Django community dedicated to documentation as a task. Um, Eric Holscher, the guy who's behind Read the Docs, has essentially got a conference going about documentation. But it's not just written docs, it's also implicit documentation. All of the bits in Django taste the same. Um, a good example of this is uh, during the development of the forms framework, at some point someone logged a bug because the keyword for specifying the length of a or maximum length of a character field in the forms framework was max length or one word. And in the models framework, it was max underscore length. Now, if you're doing a best of breed framework like Turbo Gears or you're picking and choosing, that's not a bug. It's not a bug in, uh, in, in a forms library that it doesn't use the same parameter convention as your ORM. But in Django, it is because they're all under the same, uh, same umbrella. And there is the consistency in the API is itself a feature. If you've got a Django model and you've got a Django form, the two look roughly the same. And that is in itself documentation. The upshot of all this, the Python being a readable language and an easily accessible language, the documentation, the uniformity across the parts, was that to pick a, a term from Cathy Sierra, the time, my time from zero to kick ass was about six weeks. Um, and that's the kick ass curve, if you, if you haven't seen it. Um, Cathy Sierra is a, a blogger, a tech blogger, who um, has written a number of things about creating passionate users. And the kick-ass curve is part of her explanation of how you make that happen. Anyone coming to a new project, be it Django's or an engineering project, uh, project like Django, or even just like, you know, a consumer front-end project, someone picks up your product for the first time. What is the user experience they have? How far do they go from, I have no idea how this works and I suck, to I can kick ass on this? Not that they're an expert user, but that they feel like they're an expert user. I feel like I understand how this product works. The goal to making passionate users is to make that time from zero to kick ass as small as possible. And speaking from my experience, that time was essentially a matter of hours in terms of getting into the framework and feeling like I was seriously kicking ass because I had the commit bit was six weeks. And that's six weeks part time in my own spare time, not six weeks where I was being paid to do it. It's not always about the product. Sometimes it's about framing, documentation, and learning. It's about attenuating, about making, thing, making a path more obvious, turning down the game so that people can see what it is they need to do next, narrowing and providing focus so that people can get to that kick-ass point as soon as possible. But it's not just important to get people on board. It's also important to set up an environment that lets them hang around. Now, backwards compatibility is a big part of this. It's uh, not important initially, but, uh, sorry, it wasn't important initially to Django, but it was something that where we set the groundwork for this to be a feature of Django's community long term. We didn't formally commit to backwards compatibility until 2008 when we released Django 1.0. But even before then, we documented and recorded every backwards compatible change. And there's actually still a wiki page you can go to, and it runs for you know, two or three pages printed, of all of the things we did to the API that might have affected you if you had code in the wild. Now this was a practical thing for the journal world because they did have a copy of Ellington in the world that they needed to maintain. So they needed to document all the things they needed to, to maintain as they started rolling forward. But this is an important thing for mass adoption. Backwards compatibility is exceedingly boring and it's exceedingly annoying to have to deal with. But it's essential for uptake in certain markets. Mass adoption means adoption by boring people. You need to get people who are not looking for the next cool thing. They're looking for the next stable thing they can rely upon. And backwards compatibility is one of the ways you can guarantee that. Now this is born of practicality. Django may have been an open source project, but it was being used to make money, so they needed to push it forward. Uh, another example, um, my first usage of Django commercially was on uh, government and military applications for the Australian military. Nothing in the military happens fast. Uh, I have a, there was a running joke when we were rolling out this web solution for, uh, for, the, for the Australian Army uh, for a joint exercise. We had a, sort of a, an Army uh, brigadier come in at one point and we were describing this wonderful new technology we were using. And his description was that the Army's idea of the perfect technological advancement is a self-sharpening pencil. <laughs> they don't like new technology because it's unreliable. So they don't adopt things until it is guaranteed to be reliable. And for good reason. When the bullets are coming at you, you want to make sure that everything works. 
But this is something you need to keep in mind. If you want to grow to a space where you are large and considered to be a mass project, some of these aspects are important parts of your community. It's also, just looking, it's also important, if most software development is actually maintenance, not greenfield. So if your community focus is on making it easy to develop new cool things, then um, you're going to miss, the, uh, uh, miss the, the focus of the people who actually have to maintain code long term. So what have we done badly? Well, in my opinion, one of the things the Django community has done badly is communications. It's very easy to forget when you're in the middle of something that not everybody else is paying attention to every little change. A classic example of this is the 1.5 release cycle at the moment. I have a very good picture of where the 1.5 release cycle is. But unless you have been following exactly what's going on, you probably, everyone else in this room probably doesn't. We haven't been good at communicating release schedules, the intentions of what we're going to do with the project. And sometimes this means, because we, means we make an announcement and everybody gets up in arms because they didn't know the announcement was coming. But we've been talking about it for six months. And you know, not just talking about it behind closed doors, we've been talking about it on mailing lists for six months. Now, this is also difficult because it's very, very hard to make plans in an open source project. We can't compel anyone to do anything. So you can't really make a grand announcement about what you're going to do in 12 months' time because there's no guarantee that the person who said it was a good idea and committed to doing it is actually going to be able to do it in 12 months' time. I make an announcement today that I'm going to do something, and tomorrow I get a new job and I no longer have to work on Django. Therefore, the thing that I promised I was going to do to Django goes on the back burner. There's a balance that needs to be struck there, right? because you, it's, you, you can't just say, well, we can't make announcements. You need to get the message out there or else the project appears to be dead. Um, not my elephant, not my room is a quote from Yamis Buck, who was the uh, original developer of Capistrano. Um, he was at one point railing against the fact that Capistrano didn't work properly on Windows. And someone said, well, Windows is the elephant in the room. It's the huge operating system everyone uses. It's, a, it's, it's such a huge elephant. How can you ignore it? And Yamis turned around and said, yes, but it's not my elephant and it's not my room. Um, he didn't care that Windows wasn't supported because he didn't use Windows. And to a certain extent, that is true of certain parts of the Django project. We have not been as good at supporting Windows as we have been of supporting uh, Mac and, and, uh, and Linux as, a, as a, a development platform. Because very few people on the core team are actually using Windows as anything other than let's make sure it loads in IE capacity. Less true for things like, uh, uh, sorry, still true, but less true for things like MySQL and Oracle. The original journal world was very much Postgres focused. And you know, I would be a very happy man if I never had to deal with MySQL again. So, when that kind of thing is guts, that starts getting embedded in the community, it means that certain parts of your community become ghettos. That's, that's not healthy. We've also been very, very conservative at, at various times about giving permission to do things, giving formal permission to do things. The bus factor in Django was a big issue for a long time. Uh, Jacob and Adrian were the original two core committers. They added myself, Luke and Malcolm, Yanis and Karen Tracy, or Yanis Lydell and Karen Tracy got added at some point. Um, but we were very, very hesitant to add new core developments. Now, we have partially uh, uh, resolved this. Uh, Eric Florenzano called us on it in 2010. He gave a presentation in which he said, why hasn't Alex Gaynor got the commit bit yet? And we realised at that point, yeah, this has gone too far, we need to fix this. And we did. We changed that process by which we give out the commit bit. But that changes the dynamic of the development community because all of a sudden, rather than going from seven people who you all implicitly trust, we now have 20 people who we know less about, but it means that we can maintain the momentum. So the project has to kind of adapt to how those commit bits are put around. We still have this problem with releases. The only person in the Django community at the moment who has all the keys and all the knowledge to do releases is James Bennett, which means that if James gets busy, releases don't get cut. That is a problem we are aware of. We're trying to document the process, get the keys handed around, but because security is involved, we've actually got to physically be in the same place to do key handovers, and that all becomes a nightmare. And, and, yeah. So, yeah, we are trying to address this problem, but the bus factor, making sure there is more than one person who can do something, is especially important in open source communities because so often the bus just is everyday life. It's not actually being hit by a bus. It's, oh, I've got a deadline and I can't look at this. I don't care that I said I was going to cut a release tonight. I need to fix this bug. You're not paying me. This work is getting pushed off. 
We've also been very bad at engaging non-developers. Django is a web framework, which means that we need to deal with people from the front end, graphic designers, front end developers, back end developers, DevOps people. Django's got a great community of back end database people. We have a less vibrant community of uh, front end graphic and visual designers. But we need them. Because if we don't have them, then we look like this stoic framework that was stuck in the mid-90s. Now, we've, the thing is that this is a really hard problem to bootstrap. We have, along the way, blessed a large number of people and said, please, build us a community of, de of, of, uh, of designers. And it has been almost universally successful at driving people away from the project. The single most successful way for us to make sure that no one ever commits to Django again is to give them the commit bit and say, can you do some design work for us? So this is a problem we have. We need to engage non-developers. <coughs> we also have a slight problem of the shoemaker's children having no shoes. Um, Django's own website, I've been trying to rebuild for three years. I can build a great back end, but you, for the love of all things holy, do not want me designing the front end. Um, because I don't have those skills, I need someone to help me, and that's a really difficult thing to get done. Um, there are plenty of things in the Django community that would be great to have, but until you've got the resources and someone who's willing to commit to support them, um, they don't get built. Well, they get built and then they die off because the person, the one person who's developed them has kind of lost interest. Now, a lot of these problems stem ultimately from uh, command and control problems. Everyone in the Django community can say no, or many people can say no, very few people can say yes to any particular proposition. Now, originally, Jacob and Adrian were there, they were active in the project. These days, not so much. So as a result, we've kind of lost this core driving command and control structure. This is most obvious around release times. Now, since 1.2, we what essentially what happens with the release is that at some point, someone feels guilty that we haven't put out a release, and they start actually working on driving that release forward. For 1.2, 1.3, that was essentially me. In 1.4, it was Imerica Augustine. And after the 1.4 release, I, I, met, I met him for the first time at DjangoCon last year, and he said to my face, there is no way I'm doing this for 1.5. Guess what he did for 1.5? He essentially drove the 1.5 release process, because he felt guilty about the fact we hadn't put out a release. So when there's no clear line of authority, it means that some things kind of go by the wayside, because no one feels like they've got permission to do it. Now, this encourages a certain amount of the whole Python philosophy of asking for forgiveness, not permission. And it does make your decision process a little bit robust. We've changed some of our decision-making processes so that they're not as reliant upon Jacob and Adrian making the decision. But it also means that it's opaque, and you're never really clear if a decision has been made. It's just kind of, did it get committed or didn't, or did it get rolled out or not? So it's not always obvious what's going on. Um, these sort of things require persistence. They require time. They require you to be persistent over time. You want to get a new feature into Django, you're really keyed up and you've got spare time right now, that's fantastic. But it doesn't matter if no one else in the community has got spare time to help you right now. Um, the custom user models uh, feature that's in Django 1.5, I'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. The reason that it's not in Django, or the reason it's in Django 1.5 and not Django 1.0 is because it's taken six years to get everybody to agree at the same time this is what we want to do. Um, now the most dangerous thing in the world is a volunteer who doesn't. Uh, and there are anyone who's willing to stand up and say, I'm willing to volunteer time, I'm really enthused and I'm going to help. And, but they actually need to follow through for anything to actually happen. And the biggest problem is, is resources. You know, in the early days, Django was funded by the journal world. They had a commercial interest in making sure Django succeeded. Not specifically Django, but the framework, because that was what they were basing their business on. They paid for the development they needed, and a big part of the development that was needed was managing the community. And open source for them was just a force multiplier of their engineering effort. We've now got multi-billion dollar companies emerging that use Django as their infrastructure. Um, Pinterest recently revalued at $2.5 billion. But they don't contribute financially, or in terms of obvious engineering effort, to the way that uh, to, to the progress of Django. Now, it's not calling out Pinterest. They've, they've used, picked up an open source project and used it. That's entirely within their rights to do so. And they're not the only company that, that's in the same boat. I mean, Instagram is another example of a startup. We've got Fortune 500s, we've got large government organisations using Django. 
Um, but there's no driving, there's, there's no economic force making sure any of this stuff happens. And you know, developing a release, committing a release, making sure all the, all the wheels are turned to put a release out the door takes time. And it's not fun, well, not particularly fun anyway. Um, people ask me, when is 1.5 going to be released? And the honest question is, when it's done. Because I can't say it's going to be done next Friday, because it's dependent upon everyone else in the community who needs to be there having the spare time to be able to volunteer. But that kind of looks starts to look bad after a while, because if you can't commit to where the project's going, then um, if no one can find the spare time, maybe that's a marker that the project should just kind of die off. And that's quite certainly true to a certain extent. If no one is able to find spare time to make their toolkit work better, then does that mean that no one's actually using the toolkit? But I don't know that's completely true either. Just because no one has the spare time to volunteer doesn't mean no one's using the project. Django is a very large, actively used project. We just don't have volunteers standing up to do a lot of work. And it takes a long time to build a framework, an institution, and all the tool tools that fall around Django, you know, those sort of community expectations of what it can and can't do. That shouldn't just be thrown away because a group of 20 people who currently have the commit bit don't have any spare time. So we have a problem about paying the piper. How do we? The biggest problems that exist in open source are about, in my mind, how do we actually pay for this? How do we get a community of people who all want to be able to use this open source project and value the fact that it's freely available and they can, don't have to contribute financially to acknowledge the fact that they're making large amounts of money using open source and maybe some of that should be spent either as cash or in kind to make the project better rather than sort of exploiting the, the guilt and the, uh, the naivety of people volunteering in their spare time. Now, this is an area where I am deadly serious. I don't know the answer to this. I don't know how we can build a financially safe model around open source. If anyone in this room has any bright ideas, please bring them to me because I, I am in a position as, as president of the DSF to make some things happen. And if by someone giving me a great idea, I can make the financial future of Django secure and the engineering future of Django secure, I would love to do that and I'll push a whole bunch of things off, off my radar. So, okay, most of the people in this room aren't going to be running an open source project of any size, certainly not one the size of Django. Very few people are ever going to run a project the size of Django. Um, but even if you're not the size of Django, similar issues exist, just on different scales. Uh, Daniel Lindsay is a good example. He's the maintainer of Tasty Pie and Haystack. He's a big player in the Django API space. These are projects that a lot of people use and rely upon. He's just changed his job, which means that he's no longer going to be using Django on his day job. He's going to be still using Python, but not Django so much. So he's lost this economic incentive to contribute to Tasty Pie. So he has to pass this project off. But if he hasn't, he hasn't essentially hasn't planned that. He's just kind of said, who wants to take over, over Tasty Pie? And he's just got to pick someone and give it to them. Which is kind of risky because how do you know that person's going to have a long-term process of maintaining the, you know, how do you know they're going to maintain the project long-term? But to a certain extent, I'll, I'll, I'll try and wrap this up quickly, but the, to a certain extent, this is also true about users groups. The same principles apply. You need to have a reason to exist. As a users group, you need to have a reason to, for someone to want to give up their valuable time to come to your meetings. If it's social, then you need to have a good social, a social atmosphere. If it's, um, if it's technical content, you need to have people presenting technical content. You need to solve a real problem of what is someone going to do in their afternoon and turn up at, at your users group. Culture really matters. In a technical community, it's about, is this a good engineering product? Is the documentation good? Uh, does it have the attributes of backwards compatibility and uh, an emphasis on testing that is important to you as an engineering product? And there are decisions to be made there. You know, some, some people will value backwards compatibility over, uh, over rapid development. Some people will think testing is very, very important, and some don't think it's important. They are decisions that you have to make at an engineering decision, uh, at an engineering level. Those cultural decisions also matter in social and user groups. Are you going to be a community of programmers? You know, the guy, the, the, the hey, you know, let's go crush beer cans on our head because that's what's awesome, man. Or are you going to try and be an open and inclusive environment in the hope of in getting more minorities, getting more women involved, and so on? You need to make a decision about what you, where you want your community to go long term because any decision you make about your culture 
will affect the, the development of your community long term. And if you've established yourself as a community of programmers, it's very, very hard to break those community norms over time. Part of the reason that we hesitated to adding core people to the team, or to the, the Django core team, was because adding people to a culture changes that culture. And you know, when you've got a culture that you like, it's very, very dangerous to, uh, to, to change that. There's a bus factor. You, know, you need to make sure there is more than one person who can make a decision. You can't just have one person organising your users group meeting because if they get busy, there's no meeting that month. You need to divest power amongst your groups. You need different skills. Now, particularly in a users group community, yeah, you're going to need a webmaster and someone to put up your community web page. You need people who can write, you need people who can organise, you need people who are designers. If you are dealing with money, you need lawyers and accountants. Um, and trust me from experience, trying to get lawyers and accountants to answer questions for you for free is not easy. Um, and you need people with energy, you need people with free time. That last part is universal. If you don't get anything done without volunteers, volunteers are essential. And you need resources. If you want to do anything interesting, it's going to cost money. Uh, or it need uh, either money literally in terms of cash in hand or in terms of donations in kind. Doing, doing anything takes time and it takes money. And volunteer time is incredibly precious. Physical space costs money. Hosting costs money. Uh, so you either need someone to underwrite that cost or, or treat it as an uh, as a, uh, initial outlay. But you also need to be prepared for the long haul. Uh, Joel Spolsky, a prominent developer, said good software takes 10 years. Get used to it. You need to have patience. The same is also true of, of, of development communities. Building a large community is going to take a long time. Um, everything is going to take longer than you expect and hope. And the only way it doesn't if one, is if one person has absolute authority and infinite free time. But as I've already said, that sets you down a bad path because you then have one person who is responsible. But setting expectations is also a very, very important part of this. It's not enough to just organise one meeting. Building a community over time is about people understanding at a deep level this meeting is going to keep happening. And it's worth investing my time in going to this meeting because it's going to become a regular instalment in my life. It's going to be something that's worthwhile. I'll go once just to try it out, but I'm not going to keep coming unless I know it's going to keep happening and I know that there's going to be something valuable when I turn up. And if I miss one week and I come back the next week, it's, it's going to be, I'm sorry I missed that one, but it, there's going to be a continuity there. That continuity is not something that happens overnight. It takes a long time to develop there as well. Participating needs to feel like it isn't a waste of your time. There's a limit to how many times someone will turn up to a users group meeting and be bored out of their brains. So you need to make sure that whatever you're doing to make someone feel like they're an effective part of your community happens very, very quickly. Because if they feel like they're being, if they've hit that kick-ass moment really, really quickly, then uh, they're more likely to turn up the next week and more likely to volunteer to help out and more likely to help make whatever great things you want happen. And so, yeah, it's hard work. Nothing worthwhile is ever easy. Um, I hope that I've been able to give you a sort of a little bit of insight into how Django has got to where it is today and maybe you've able to use some of that information for your own projects, your own, uh, own community. Um, I'm happy to take any questions now about anything that you, you've got about, any questions you've got about how Django got where it is today. I don't pretend to have all the answers. I have a sample of exactly one. Maybe two if you count Django Evolution, which is my side project, which was a monumental failure in terms of community. So uh, I've done it well and I've done it badly. Uh, if, if anyone wants to quiz me on that, um, I can work with the questions. Thank you. Thank you. most complicated uh, part for you personally in driving the community? The hardest part is not becoming disillusioned when things don't happen quickly. Um, like I said, we, I've been trying to, like, my, when I came on board as the DSF president in July 2010, um, my immediate goal was let's, okay, let's, let's get the Django website updated because it's starting to look a little bit dated. It's now 2013. We don't have an updated website. And there are a number of reasons for that. Now, it's stemming from things like you ask for a volunteer, the volunteer is incredibly enthusiastic for two months, and then they get busy. And this prototype that kind of built then dies off. And you know, you, it's very hard to find people who are designers who could provide that front end design that you need, need to happen. You know, I don't have those skills myself, um, so I need to find someone who's going to be enthused. I need to convince them to volunteer. 
and then they, they lose volunteer, they, they, they lose their, their momentum and it falls off. And it, some of that has been my fault, I will certainly admit that, because in order to maintain that momentum, you, can't, you need to stay on top of it. And it's very, very easy to drop that ball. You forget to send someone an email for a month, and they've just kind of forgotten and moved on. And then you have to start the process from scratch, and you've burnt that volunteer's enthusiasm, because now they've moved on to their other thing, they, they're not interested in doing that anymore. So you've got to find someone else who's willing to volunteer. Um, so th that's, that's essentially my, my biggest, that's what I consider to be the hardest thing is. Anything you're trying to do with volunteer resources will take much, much longer than you think it, it should take. Simply because you need everyone's volunteer time to coincide, and that almost never happens. So you need to be there constantly pushing it and pushing it to make sure it happens, and if you push it enough, eventually everyone's calendars will coincide and you can get a decision made or move something forward as you need to go. So that, that, I'd say that would be my biggest, biggest hurdle. More questions, please? Uh, thank you. Uh, my question. How it happens that a uh, big software, a uh, big company who use Django uh, don't fight back. I was sure that big companies uh, like to buy technical support because uh, they prefer to use software with technical support. That's an interesting point. Um, the catch is that I've never seen it work in practice because it kind of... It under, the, the, the proposition... You're, you're right, that uh, Eric Raymond wrote his Cathedral on the Bazaar paper and then followed up with a couple of others about how, to, how technical support is how you make money. The bit that it misses is that technical support is only technically needed if no one understands how to use your product. No one uses your product if it isn't easy to use. So a, a good, for, for a while there, it was very, very hard to get anyone to publish a book about Django because the publisher's opinion was that Django's documentation was so good, it undermined the market for commercial books on Django. Now, does that mean that we take down our documentation? No, because the reason Django is successful, one of the reasons Django is successful, is that it has great documentation, and that it is easy to understand, which means that it gets picked up by people. And you know, By being useful, by being easy to use, you undermine the need for the support. Now, okay, that's not universal. When you get to very large organisations, they don't care whether they need it or not, they just want to know that there's someone there. But then you've got to have someone who sets up their company and takes the financial risk about providing that support. And that's a difficult thing to bootstrap as a, as a, as a company, um, you know, as, a, as, a, as a business proposition that is related to the project, which is kind of where you, you know, want to make sure... You know, uh, sorry, step this back. As an example, Jacob Kaplan Moss does sell consulting services around Django. Jacob has his contributions to Django's code base, I would say, have gone down since he started doing this. Because when someone's paying you consulting services to provide guaranteed support for their website, they want you to fix their problem, not Django. They want you to fix that specific thing or build that specific thing. And the project doesn't need that. It needs someone whose job it is to guarantee that the blog post is written every Monday and that the release cycle is being managed effectively and keep on top of people who are contributing patches and things like that. It's the money for community management and organisation that the consulting model doesn't cover very well unless, as, a, as an organisation, the person who's providing the consulting services says, I'm going to increase my prices by 5% and that's going to go into a common pool. But then you end up in a situation where, like, okay, let's say Jacob decided he was going to donate 5% of all of his income to the DSF to help further the interests of Django. His prices are now 5% higher than every other consultant in the Django space because no one else is required to donate that money. So he's now at an economic disadvantage and he's relying upon the, the goodwill of people saying, I'm willing to pay 5% more to benefit Django as a whole. And whilst a certain amount of People, a certain percentage of people will engage in altruism. Taken from the experience of getting people to donate to the DSF, it's hard work. The number one thing that I, I've, I've propositioned any number of companies in Australia 
to say, would you please donate to the Django Software Foundation? I see you are a large, successful software company. You've made a lot of money selling a Django-related product. Would you please donate to the Django Software Foundation? The number one response I get back is, what do I get in return? Other than this framework you're using to make money? Um, you know, it's, it's a frustrating conversation to have. So that's, that's why I think the consulting angle doesn't work. I'm, so if someone wants to work, tell me how we can tweak that model so that it does work. I'm certainly open, open, open to have that discussion. Anyone else? Uh, do you plan in uh, some migration system uh, from uh, database uh, state A to state B? <laughs> tomorrow's talk. I'll cover that tomorrow. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm giving a second talk tomorrow. It's the, I think it's the last talk on the program. So that is something that I will be addressing directly then. So I will, I will save my card off till to, to tomorrow. Okay, well, stable users uh, didn't have uh, uh, some relation to another table. But uh, one day it, uh, it happened. <laughs> so uh, SyncDB uh, too, uh, doesn't uh, provide uh, this relation to database uh, now. Uh, do you plan to make it uh, in the future? <laughs> yeah, again, I think I'm, I'll, I'll be covering some of that tomorrow. Okay, so the tomorrow's talk is about the a Django 1.6 and the roadmap going forward, and part of that, the migration issue, the sort of thing you're talking about, both in terms of how does it directly apply to the user model and how does it relate to um, migrations in general, database migrations in general, is part of what I'm talking about tomorrow. Okay, uh, so. Related to the previous question, which was, um, what does work for data mining data foundation? <laughs> um, not a great deal, honestly. Um, the the people that have donated are doing it. They, they they tend to be companies like Cactus and Lincoln Loop that are well known in the Django community and are very very open about being altruistic. So they are doing it for their essentially almost internal promotional reasons of hey we're giving back to the community we are good community players which I completely applaud but is in no way universally accepted as a business practice. Um, our larger donated uh, larger donations we get uh, uh, Google is not formally part of the Django Software Foundation but they do give us or have been for the last couple of years given us very large cash donations related to funding Django Sprints. And they're doing it essentially to be known as the large company that gives money to open source organisations. And they go through the Summer of Code projects and things like that. Uh, Microsoft recently became a member of the Django Software Foundation because um, they want to start pushing Django as part of their Azure platform. Um, and some of that, from Microsoft's perspective, is kind of a misunderstanding of how it works. The, the original conversations we were having with them is if we give you money, will you put this into the Django source tree? Which is two completely separate issues. So there's a, there's a cultural thing that's kind of missing. And we've, we've, I hope we've kind of uh, shown them how it works. Uh, that, and they've just kind of tried to. They have donated money to us without the expectation that something is necessarily going to happen. And we've tried to teach them how it will happen. Um, beyond that, though, it really is an altruism thing. The, the companies that have donated it because they've been altruistic. So I'm, I'm surprised you haven't figured out some sort of value that you can provide them. What would that value be? And that, that's essentially what we... At some point, in order to provide an economic incentive, you need to either withhold something from the general community or provide something to them that you're not providing to someone else. And that provides a direct economic incentive to give us money because we will, we will spend it on the general community. But what is that thing? Well, I mean, you have a community, so I'm wondering if some sort of either... Uh, I mean, in a lot of cases, people sponsor things for you know, promotional reasons. Yes, and they do. We have no difficulty getting sponsors for DangoCon. Um, Python is a similar sort of thing. They have no difficulty getting sponsors for an event because they can put their name up on the wall and be seen publicly as a thing. Donating to the foundation, they get their name on a website, which is not a website that anyone goes to. So it's kind of the, the, the advertising proposition isn't there. Could we make that better? Sure, but I also don't want to start running banner ads on the January Project homepage, so um, maybe there's a variation on that, I don't know. Okay, thank you once again.
Thank you. Thank you very much.